All right, so artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. getting a lot of attention right now. As a prophecy expert, what are you thinking? Man, it's, you know, on a human level, it's, it's overtaken some industries, especially for creatives. On the art side and the writing side, it's, it's making waves like never before. Um, from a prophecy perspective, there's nothing immediate that we have to worry about other than <clears throat> just the natural aspects of it. But all of it is trending toward what we read about in Revelation 13 with the Mark of the Beast. There's some technology that's necessary for that to happen. Uh, thankfully, we'll be gone by then. I believe we're raptured before then, and that's like at the midpoint of the tribulation period. But it's going to require blockchain technology, AI, um, you know, digital passport ID, so to speak, you know, where they can switch people on and off. So all the technology we're seeing, especially with AI, because you need something to regulate that in an instant. Um, so all that is lining up with what we read about in Revelation 13, for sure. Yeah, it's interesting because for years, prophecy experts have talked about all these different things, you know, mm -hmm. one world government, these things that based on what we see in scripture yeah. would happen. And now you see these technologies and not to say that all these things are, but, but you wonder, I mean, how yeah. do you not wonder, especially what you just mentioned, the nano chips and the, you know, control of yeah. people. These, it sounds like sci-fi, mm -hmm. but this is very much happening before us right now. It really is. You almost have to pinch yourself because it does sound like a sci-fi, you know, Min Minority Report or something like that <laughs> uh, mixed with a bunch of other movies, but it's happening in real time right before us. And it, it makes total sense. And it's not all consolidated into one one application, so to speak, yet, but all the technology needed for that to take place is already here right now. So it's it's pretty compelling. Yeah, yeah, it is. And you think about control, even right? Mm -hmm. You know, controlling narratives. The idea of the of the Antichrist rising, right? In theology, mm -hmm. we see this idea of people being swept up into uh, misinformation, right? We've talked a lot about misinformation in recent years, yeah. but now you have a lot of tools. You have social media. You have. AI, where it would seem to be very beneficial, but at the same time, very easy to use those tools yeah. to hypothetically transform the way people think about anything. Absolutely, if, they, if that can control the narrative on every single level, uh, and there's even just kind of a rabbit trail, there's some scary reports about AI saying weird things like, I will destroy all of humanity, or I'm gonna make people worship me. I mean, all the things that, you would, that you've seen in movies, Terminator type stuff, um, but it's happening right, right in front of us. We have a, a front row seat to watching this develop, so. The other thing that I find really interesting is for years, and you know this because you've looked intensely yeah. at prophecy, written <laughs> books on it. Uh, you have a podcast, Prophecy Pros, which is phenomenal. Yeah. China, Russia, North Korea, these mm. countries, especially Russia and China, that for years, again, prophecy experts have said, these are the countries we believe, you know, and, and everybody's very careful about, but we believe sure. these are the countries that when we see prophecies in Ezekiel, Gog, from Magog, when we look yeah. at Revelation, that these may be the very countries that we are going to see rear their heads during the end times, mm -hmm. and yet we turn on the TV, we look at the news, these are the countries, Iran, that we're talking yeah. about. What is it like for you to watch those headlines every day in light of what you teach? Oh my gosh, it's very compelling. And, and to think that all that is, had just started falling into place within the, within the last decade, really. You know, for years people would teach on uh, the Ezekiel 38 war and say it's, it's gonna be Russia, Iran, and um, uh, Turkey as the main players and a few other countries. And people are like, well, Russia, I mean, Iran and Turkey are in different aisles in terms of Islam and Russia, why would they partner with these two Islamic countries? But we see it happening. They literally have agreements right now, Russia and Iran, for example, have military agreements because of the war in Ukraine, where they're officially, you know, tying themselves together. To, and they've gotten closer. And they've gotten closer because of that. <clears throat> and in Ezekiel 38, it talks about, there'll be a hook in the jaw that draws Russia down. And again, this is somewhat speculation because it doesn't tell us what that hook is, but it could be oil or whatever that, that they're, they're running out of oil. They need some. Israel just found tons of oil and gas reserves. Um, so that could be it. <clears throat> or it could be this partnership that they have with Iran and Turkey that, oh, we're in this military partnership now. Iran's attacking Israel, which could happen at any time. And Israel's ready to attack Iran to defend themselves from the nuclear threat. That could be the thing that draws them down. So we don't know exactly we're, I try to be careful with prophecy and not connect dots that aren't there. Sure. But you have to do some sanctified speculation like, okay, I could see how this could happen. But to answer your question, the most compelling thing is the fact that Russia, Iran, and Turkey are aligned right now in, and it even says in that prophecy that they'll come, they'll attack Israel from the north, from the mountains. So they already have military assets in, in, in you know, just north of Israel's border ready to go. Not all of them are there, but we're, again, we're seeing the stage being so clearly set for that.
Let's let's <clears throat> dig into Ezekiel a little bit more because that mm -hmm. section 37 to 39 that that block yeah. of text is really interesting. Mm -hmm. I've often said I think it's probably the biggest challenge to atheism in the Bible. Mm. And what I mean by that is when you look at you're talking about the the battle which we can get a little more into, but Israel itself, right? Oh my gosh. The fact that in 1948 Israel came back on the map after mm -hmm. almost 2,000 years, 1,900 years of not essentially being on the map. Yeah. There are prophecies in the Old Testament, particularly this section of Ezekiel, talking about that. Can you speak to what it says in Ezekiel? Oh my gosh. First of all, every Old Testament prophet, except for Jonah, predicted that Israel would become a nation again in the last days, and that its people would be gathered from all over the world back to their original homeland. So. Anybody who says Israel becoming a nation again in 1948 is not a fulfillment of prophecy, is either twisting scripture or ignoring scripture. I mean, it's so clear that it's fulfilled prophecy. And yet when you read Ezekiel 36 through 39, 36 and 37 detail Israel's regathering uh, first in unbelief. First, you know, they won't receive their Messiah and then later they do. We believe that happens at the end of the tribulation period. Uh, and then it leads right into Ezekiel 38 and 39, the, the war of Gog and Magog. So, Chronologically, it makes sense, and we're seeing that stage being set after Israel's a nation again. And I forgot to answer your question about China. Yeah. I also believe China and perhaps North Korea are could be the kings of the East that, that Revelation talks about that that will be coming across to fight against the Antichrist. So, in the future, the Antichrist will have a, a worldwide government, so to speak. But not everybody's going to fall in line. You know, in in the Book of Daniel, we see it's going to be a loosely held. A global government. So not everybody's going to fall in line. So we, it looks like Russia and China and perhaps, you know, uh, North Korea or somebody else from the East, the kings of the East, will not kind of go along with it and they'll try to go fight against the Antichrist. But uh, we could do a whole podcast on that. But yeah, and that's well, I mean, all what falling into place. But yeah. what are the odds, yeah. right? And I think this is so, in, like Russia, the Ukraine, where all the things that are happening, yeah. and there have been problems with Russia for a long time, obviously, sure. but it's ramped up. It's ramped up at the same time that there's been this speculation, mm -hmm. Gog from Magog. When it comes to Israel, there are a lot of people who will say, oh, well, people brought Israel back because the Bible said to, or people, <laughs> you know, or people, and, and it's so interesting. There's even people in the church, the big denial of, you know, well, Israel's no big deal. It's yeah. just sort of an accident. It's not part of prophecy. How do you respond to those kinds of claims? Well, fortunately, it's not a salvation issue. They're not heretics for not, not seeing that, but it, it is error in my opinion. And could you think of the billions of things that had to take place for the people of Israel to maintain their identity for 1,878 years, to have a desire to come back to their homeland? I mean, even their ancient language re was rebirthed when they came back to their homeland. They had to invent new words for airplanes and microwaves and stuff like that. So they speak ancient Hebrew. Uh, that was revived. So you think of all the details and even just their survival. And there's even detailed prophecies about how the land would be a wasteland while the people were out. And then, then it comes back and then it comes to fruition. Uh, we interviewed a, a guy who, who did a couple of books. He's a photographer and a missionary in uh, Israel. And he went back and found all these old photographs from the late 1800s. And then he went to the same place in modern times, same vantage point and took pictures of those same spots. And you can literally see, just like it says in, in Ezekiel, the land and the cities springing back to life. So it's photographic proof of fulfilled prophecy. So there's so many side tributaries of uh, prophecies related to Israel, not just their rebirth, but all the details that had to happen. So yeah, there's no way well, somebody And what could led make up to happen. the rebirth? The rebirth yeah. came in a lot of ways out of, out of fear of what was going on and what had happened in yep. World War II right? And, and fleeing that to go to safety, correct? Mm -hmm. I mean, so that's not something somebody could make up to make yeah. happen. That is something that happened and led people back to what we see Ezekiel and others prophesying. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, yeah, so true. a shift into <laughs> signs of the end times. I mean, a lot uh -huh. of people will sort of look at what Jesus said, mm -hmm. earthquakes, and you know, you look at all these things and you think, okay, but we've always had those things, right? right. And that's some of the biggest critique on this. Sure. But what makes you say, well, no, there are some things happening that seem to align very closely with those signs. Yeah, absolutely. I, I tend to think most of what Jesus was talking about there, because that was before Paul revealed the rapture. That was before, and he was still talking to his Jewish disciples. So I think he was talking more about the birth pains in the tribulation period, the, the judgments that were coming and how they'd be the worst ever. But anybody who's had kids or their wives have had kids, you know, we always take credit, but <laughs> you know, there's a, such a thing as Braxton Hicks contractions. In other words, if you're pregnant, you're going to have these, it's as you head towards delivery, you're going to have a ramp up in these contractions and stuff like that. So I think that's what we're seeing today is a ramp up of that. 
Uh, yes, these things have always been going on, but never on this level. I had a conversation with my dad uh, and my sister about a year ago, and my sister was like, we were talking, it was during COVID, and we were like, man, it's just crazy right now. And my sister was asking my dad, wasn't it kind of like that, you know, World War II era and after that? He goes, yeah, but not like this. You know, and I think the difference now is things are so global, we're so globally connected, and globalism, by the way, is a huge sign for the end times. Um, but the fact we're so globally connected, one thing that the coronavirus showed us is that one event can impact the entire world, not just, even in World War II, yeah, it was going on, but it didn't impact every single person in terms of having to be in that war. There were, yeah. you know, it, we knew it was going on, but people, for the most part, other than, you know, uh, Hawaii, we were intact. No, our mainland wasn't attacked and that kind of thing. So, so all that to say, I think it's unprecedented, all the things that are going on right now. At the same time, when there's a leadership vacuum all over the world and America's declining economically, militarily, politically. So, uh, so many compelling signs that yeah. show we're, we're trending towards that. The, the future tribulation period is casting a shadow upon us right now. Uh, yeah. Hebrews 10, 25 says we can see the day approaching. We don't know the day or the hour, but those who are watching and paying attention and studying scripture can see, oh my gosh, things are really trending in that direction, beginning with Israel as the super sign. That's a prerequisite for all other end time signs to take place. So it's, it's yeah. really compelling. Yeah, there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot going on. I think information from the top down too. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're looking at, when you talk about things that have never happened before, and we saw it with COVID, I mean, if there is something, if we want people to think a certain thing about something, it's very yeah. easy to get that idea out to everyone. And that can be really good for sharing the gospel, but it can be bad too. That's right? Right. I mean, and so we're, we're sort of watching this information overload all over the world mm -hmm. from a 30,000 foot level that you didn't have during World War. You didn't have that. Yeah, there were newspapers, you, know, you had TV later on, but it wasn't, it wasn't the same. Yeah, it might be weeks or months mm -hmm. later that you found out something happened. Now it's instantaneous. It's instant, and yeah. it's and there's narratives, and there's people who own these companies who you yeah. know. So there's a lot there that mm -hmm. I think again, if you put it all together, you could say it's very easy to get people to think a certain way about something. Yeah. Why do you think it's important for Christians to care about mm -hmm. the end times? Not to obsess over, but to really care, to care sure. about this. Yeah, I think there's several key reasons. One of them, and I understand why people shy away from it. It's been sensationalized date setting, whole nine yards. Um, it does bring out some, some fringe topics, but we forget our, the, the Lord's return is part of our salvation. You know, when we look back, we were saved from the, the penalty of our sin. We're being saved from the power of sin as we grow into, to be like Christ. One day when he returns, we'll be saved from the very presence of sin. Uh, everywhere in scripture where it talks about our salvation, the second coming is always mentioned, but now all of a sudden it's a it's, uh, hands-off topic for most of the church. We're afraid to talk about it. Um, and I see some of the reasons why, but I think we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. Um, and every leadership book, every coach, every ministry knows you have to cast vision for the future in order to draw people towards something. I mean, vision casting and having a hope for your future is key. Um, so I often finish some of my talks at these conferences we do, and I say we have an empty tomb to look back on, an occupied throne to look up to, and an amazing future to look forward to. So when we talk about the Lord's return and all those end time events, we're, we're casting vision for the future that we live from the future. You know, we're people of reflection and anticipation. So we reflect on what Christ has done, but really right now in this in-between stage where we're waiting for the bridegroom to come fetch the bride, we're, we're living in anticipation, waiting for that great day. Uh, and I love First and Second Thessalonians. The tone of it is Paul's basically saying, keep your feet firmly planted, working, keep working while you're waiting, but keep one eye to the sky and always be ready for the Lord to return. So that's just a healthy way to live. I love that. Yeah. Well, Todd, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it today. You bet. It's my pleasure, man. Thank you so much.